So I think um, explaining why we are called um, South-South uh, movement is in order first. Um, I think um, we have a very de-hemispheric understanding of what South-South means. Um, we understand it as a shared um, experience of peripherality in the academia, but also under um, kind of uh, power structures um, such as race, gender, class, um, neocoloniality. And we use the word movement as a kind of um, semantic move, if you like, to kind of oppose it um, against the conventional research groups that you see in, in, um, in universities. And I think this will become clear, clearer um, later on as we explain um, why um, this group is, 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 is needed in a global North uh, institutional context. Um, I think we see uh, a need for an open space um, where this shared um, political subjectivity is, um, is heard, made more visible um, among South South students themselves. Um, and also within an increasingly internationalized uh, global North institution such as CEU, who prides itself in um, being open to uh, the idea of uh, open society, um, internationalism, globalism even. Um, and we see uh, kind of this move movement within that context, kind of um, uh, building this um, um, uh, framework for open dialogue uh, from students and as well as um, academics um, to kind of have a, a really open discussion about uh, the position of South South students within um, academia. We also uh, have a twin proposition as a transnational uh, student collective. So first we want to uh, promote um, researchers from from the global south with the understanding that these are not really territor territorialized conceptions, but as a shared um, political subjectivity. And also to um, the center ways of uh, knowing and researching and writing um, in different fields. So within the movements right now, we have uh, colleagues working on uh, gender studies, IR, politics, public policy, and we want to reach out uh, to uh, more disciplines and, and, and really work with, with students who are interested in the kind of issues that, that we are working on. Um, in terms of um, to whom kind of this uh, movement is open to, we are very much uh, um, open to postgraduate students and researchers, as well as um, um, allied um, academics uh, both at CEU and, and, and beyond. So uh, this is really, we speak to this notion of, of transnationality and, 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 and we embrace that. Um, and finally, how you can get involved and maybe what to expect from us um, later on. Um, we want to organize a series of conversations with um, fellow travelers like um, our guests uh, at the moment from uh, decolonial subversions and uh, to organize perhaps reading group discussions as well, um, make available peer review sessions where students can present their work um, on uh, global south uh, issues, etc. Uh, as well as building a resource library of works uh, that are necessarily not from the mainstream and more, more focused on um, uh, um, those works that really speak to uh, the interests uh, and needs of, of, of students from, from the global south. So that would be kind of in a nutshell how, how we envision uh, the movement and we are open to um, those who are interested to help shape this movement as we, uh, as we move forward. I know that uh, calling it a movement sounds very uh, starry eyed, but if you like, we see it really aspirationally. Um, um, and I hope that will become clearer as we 
uh, engage with our guests um, later on. I think I would perhaps stop there unless maybe Tara for Ayn, if, if you want to add to that, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, that was that was a, a, a brilliant summation. And I just would ask if you would also introduce yourself and then following so that we can also put a, so we're currently the co-chairs the co um, of this um, group who we hope will have a, a kind of a rotating uh, structure of different chairs coming in. So for now, it's the three of us and please Antonio, if you would introduce yourself. So at the moment, I'm a PhD uh, candidate in public policy at CU. Um, I research um, EU preferential trade policies from the point of view of those countries we imagine as least developed or developing. Um, um, yeah. Tara. Um, yes, um, so I'm also a PhD candidate um, at CEU within the track of public policy, though um, I see myself as more of a political ecologist, um, um, uh, as my background is in environmental sciences, and I um, research um, how communities, specifically rural and uh, nomadic communities, respond to environmental changes and livelihood stresses with a particular focus on resource governance, marginalization, and state and tribe relations in West Asia and North Africa. Ayn, please go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Ayn, and I'm from Kashmir, and I'm doing my PhD in IR on uh, transformation of the colonized body intergenerationally, and uh, I work usually from decolonial perspectives. So that's that's very pretty much what. Okay, with that, um, I just want to kind of add a bit of um, maybe background on why specifically as the movement, we decided that this would be the ideal um, conversation to launch uh, uh, into. Um, I think that we all know that publishing is definitely seen as the currency of academia and a lot of times that uh, current structures do not really leave space for those who want to, especially uh, whether it's PhD students or early researchers, to share their critical works outside the mainstream. And this can, this can be a point of stress that can often result in many of us having to make con concessions um, in our points of view in order to get published. Um, and main most mainstream journals have limited space of any for the forms of knowledge sharing outside the boundaries of what's considered scientific, valid, noble, and ultimately good social science within the Western academia. Um, and that often pushes researchers and their work into these very limited boxes. And so when we were initiating this movement, one of the things that we wanted to ensure is that we tackle the practicalities of academia and seek out spaces where scholars can share critical works without compromising for the sake of getting their work out there. Um, and it's with this spirit that we are very happy to have uh, members of decolonial subversions here uh, because this is uh, um, one of those platforms that we need more of in terms of its um, uh, uh, commitment to decentering uh, Western epistemology in humanities and in social sciences. Um, so with that, I would like to open the floor to um, our guests to uh, um, please introduce themselves uh, within whatever order that works for them and tell us more about the journal before we uh, begin the conversation. Monica, do you want to go first? <laughs> to reverse the orders from the blurb. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, first of all, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever you're, uh, you're tuning in today. <laughs> and thank you so much for the South South Movement, for Taras and Antonio uh, for contacting us and fine. Um, yeah, so I'm Monica, one of the founders, together with Romina, of the Colonial Subversions, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the moment at SOAS um, in the Department of Religions and Philosophies. 
when I'm I'm basically looking at a um, South Indian goddess and at how um, it, the practice of its rich, of the rituals around this goddess, which are practices at the margins of uh, Hindu traditions, how these have an impact on understandings of gender, of the body, of motherhood, and of ontology, of the human being itself. So um, it really leads me to a very decolonial understanding of concepts that in the West we are giving very often for granted. And not only that, we also tend to universalize them. So yeah, I'm at the, my research is at the intersection between anthropology, relig religious studies, South Asian studies, and decolonial studies. Um, yeah, and with Romina then since uh, we have been collaborating for a while, ever since we met at SOAS, uh, <laughs> we'll go more into detail later um, about this. But uh, yeah, other than my PhD, currently I'm working on decolonial subversions. And I would like them to pass it on to Romina. Thank you, Monica. Excellent. Uh, yes, I'm the other co founder with Monica. Um, currently, oh goodness, it's. I'm too old to go back too far, <laughs> uh, but uh, I've, I've have, I have about a decade's experience as a practitioner working with rural communities, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. And for the past 10 years or so, uh, my work and, and life, life's vision really has been to bridge uh, gender and development theory with communities on conceptual repertoires around gender subjectivity and humanity uh, in order to um, uh, you know, design and, and develop uh, community sensitive and, and, you know, religio culturally sensitive approaches to gender sense to, to gender related issues in these societies, primarily tradition oriented religious societies of Africa. So my previous work was in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tehada community. Uh, and prior to that, I've also worked in Senegal, Tanzania, Ghana and uh, Rwanda. Uh, and uh, since 2015, I've been at SOAS, first as a PhD student. Currently, I am a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow, uh, leading my own project. It's a research and innovation project, a decolonial project that aims to address uh, domestic violence um, in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the UK. Again, working uh, in religious, culturally sensitive ways and considering the, the, the belief systems of, of the communities involved um, and how to integrate these in domestic violence support systems. Uh, in parallel, I have been uh, very much active in decolonizing not just epistemology within my own disciplines, uh, but also uh, open access publishing with Monica. Uh, prior to that, we were um, leading the Social Journal of Postgraduate Research, and uh, I have been an open access advocate in the institution. And in 2019, uh, I worked as a research funding officer uh, here at SOAS after uh, finishing my PhD because I was really interested to understand the, the funding structures and the inequalities in funding within uh, the academic landscape. Um, and, uh, and I was fortunate enough to uh, set up the Decolonizing Research Initiative with Dr. Alex Lewis, our director of research. Uh, so we have been very much involved liaising with funders and raising awareness about the structural inequalities in research development and funding, um, as well as epistemology. So that's me in a nutshell. And I'll pass the word to Danilo since I'm speaking. And Danilo is one of our newest members, more recent members, uh, and additions to the colonial subversions. And we're very, very excited to have him on our team. Danilo, okay. the word is yeah. yours. Um, Good, good afternoon or good morning or good evening from my side as well. My name is Danilo Babic. I am from Serbia. I am a PhD candidate at Belgrade University, Faculty of Political Science, International Relations section. Uh, my focus is on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I uh, re-examine the roles of old and new actors in sub-Saharan Africa. The old, I mean, of course, the former colonial powers, the new, I mean, China and India, amongst others. I'm currently employed at Institute of International Politics and Economics in Belgrade. So that's it for now. So I don't know who is next. So somebody can take the, the floor. I don't know who to call. That would be Ayn. <laughs> Please go ahead then. She will be the moderator for uh, our conversation today. 
uh hi guys i know i'm uh, new to you all uh, because i haven't been in contact um but uh, we we if if we, if it is possible let's start this discussion with how you uh, came up with the idea of starting something called decolonial subversions what was it what were the motivations and uh, what are uh, what are your primary maybe objectives if if that's the correct word to use like the aims or whatever uh that you have with this project which sounds fascinating and yeah let's start with that maybe monica can i share the slides where you speak yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that would be great um, we just have a few slides for a visual effect, just so that you don't look at us while <laughs> you can see something different. Uh, is this coming to you all? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Monica, let you take the floor. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. This <laughs> um, so, Romina and I go back to. Uh, 2015, as Romina first was mentioning, when we both started our PhD. Um, our personal histories have brought us in contact with um, yeah, societies that are not part of the um, global north, so to say. While Romina in Ethiopia, I have lived for like nine years in India. So um, coming to SOAS has been, has had an impact on um, we started seeing certain dynamics that we were not so uh, comfortable with, so to say, and uh, especially as um, I think Ayn and Taraf were also saying, uh, especially as much concern for what concerns the publication of like young scholars, PhD candidates. Um, so we had this opportunity to step to take on editorship of the source journal of postgraduate research, which, um, which we did for a couple of years. And we took, it, it was the regular um, postgrad uh, and research journal, uh, where we, we managed on the one side to um, professionalize it. It was like a student-led um, journal, which was not too, maybe not enough attention was given to it and we took the, this opportunity to really try and um, promote diversity promote young researchers and um, critical thinking also in many in, in different ways um, however after a after a while, we also saw that there was a lot of scope to grow and we really wanted to, to grow. We wanted to bring it all into more decolonial uh, environments, but we kept facing obstacles because we were within, it was within the confines of the university. And despite SOAS being a very, um, one of the most um, outspokenly decolonial institutions, there are still uh, some barriers that we have faced. And we sort of realized that within an institution, an institutional um, publication, we were not able to fully uh pursue our aims so we decided uh, so after being editors of the source journal of postgrad uh, postgraduate research between 2016 and 18 we decided to work on our separate project uh which uh, <laughs> which we have been we, we started working on in 2018 we started really thinking and contacting various people and um crystallizing our ideas and around i think 2019 we came up with our name with decolonial subversions which we thought um really sums up what we stand for and what we um hope to promote or like the movement that we want to be part of and we launched in 2020 so we are very new in terms of um yeah of, of uh, online platform um just about a year so it's in on 30th of march we are a year old mm -hmm. um yeah and decolonial subversions is as you can see, we, we will later share also um, our web page. Uh, Decolonial Subversions is a, um, a network and a platform. So uh, we call it a publishing platform because uh, we do not want to 
be limited by any constraints, anything that is established, so to say, in, uh, in university, academia, or other um, hierarchical institutions. And it's a network because we want to be decentralized, we want to uh, be democratic. Um, and this can be seen in, in a lot of aspects, we hope. First of all um, is, for example, the way in which uh, contributions can be submitted, which can be um, written, they can be um, acoustic and also visual. So here we don't want to, for example, impose any restrictions um, as to how people want to express their knowledge or how they want to create and share and diffuse their knowledge. Uh, the other one other pillar of uh, decolonial subversions is the fact that we are not we, we, we do not want to limit to be limited to English on the contrary it, we aim to um, have contributions in as many languages as possible. Um, unfortunately, we still have to also have the English version of each contribution because we don't want to also um, we want to make the, the material from um, the colonial material is still available also for the uh, for an English speaking public. Um, importantly, also when it comes to format, like even not only when not only do we have the uh, visual, acoustic, and written contributions, but also when it comes to written um, contributions, we look at a much broader way of um, expressing knowledge and producing knowledge. We don't uh, expect people to submit essays in the structure that we are all used to uh, from the from an Anglo, um, Anglophone environment, which generally has an introduction, then it has uh, a set of um, analytical points, and then a conclusion. Um, we have realized that this limits very much, very often, the uh, not only the expression of knowledge, but even just the, the, the prior stage of formulating knowledge, because that is always like it's um, it's an alive process. So if you already have to think in terms of the structure in which you want to put it, and you have not you are not coming from a from from an um, UK university, for example, then you can have a lot of um, difficulties in this. And I have noticed that having studied in um, in Italy and in India, that in it creates a block. Um, so we allow people to um, submit contributions in any format, in any language, in any style. Um, the other, okay, so Romina has put up the, the, some of the principles um, that yeah are to be found also in our manifesto. Um, yeah, it's. I think some of them will be going, we will be going in more detail later. Romina may go into detail a bit later. Um, but another thing that I wanted to just highlight quickly was the different type of peer review process also that we have uh, introduced. Um, so again, coming from academia, we are often used to a peer review process um, that is anonymous, blind. Uh, which, however, is not, sometimes it's a fake type of anonymity, anonymity, because when somebody deals with a very specific topic, then um, even if your name is omitted, then people from the field will identify you. And a lot of, again, um, uh, censorship can go on at that level, both from the side of the reviewer who may again block certain uh, information as well as from the side of the of the author who may have a preventive uh, censorship already so uh, Romina and I have then opted instead for offering also an open review process where the um, the reviewer and the uh, the contributor are in direct contact uh, and create a feedback to each other and hopefully also establish a connection and widen this network of uh, decolonial thinkers and decolonial practitioners. And the other important thing is that since we are, um, we are not only looking at academic production, as I was just saying, uh, in the sense of essays, which are structured in a certain way, we, we accept anything from pho photography essays, to um, podcasts, to field notes, 
uh, storytelling, uh, anything. So obviously the peer review has to be um, commensurate. So an artist will be reviewed by an artist, for example, but peer review is always with two, right? So we insist on having one peer reviewer coming at, at least one from the global south. So this way we hope to, um, you know, to take away certain uh, blocks from the diffusion of knowledge that, that, that both Romain and I have faced as, um, as young academics. And I'm sure many of you have also faced. Um, and yeah, and as I was just mentioning, this is not just an academic project, it's much broader. It really um, goes, um, from activists to artists to, uh, it can be a street vendor who has um, a lot of, you know, uh, street knowledge because, you know, everyday life is what makes, uh, what creates wisdom. And very often this wisdom is looked down upon the moment we enter this, uh, you know, the, the tower of academia. So this is something that, um, we really would like to bridge all these differences and especially the hierarchies that are going on. Um, so I have gone into a little bit more depth of a couple of the principles um, um, and a bit how Romina and I came to where we are now. It's, it's also like a work in project. We, neither Romina nor I um, <laughs> have the pretense of knowing what the colonial um, creation, diffusion of knowledge is. Um, so it's a, it's a continuous work in progress. And we, um, we grow along with everyone who is part of it and along with these networks, such as we are hopefully creating also currently with the South-South movement. So yeah, uh, I think uh, this is it for a short introduction, and um, I think Romina now can go more in depth of some of the other points. Is that okay? Sorry? <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Thank you so much. Is that okay with the uh, organizers? I can say a little bit also about uh, my background and absolutely. just to add a few more yeah, insights. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Please go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. I, yes, I think Monica did a, a great job, uh, you know, giving you the background and, and the motivations and, and you know, the, the various debates we have had in the background, it, it, can, it might seem as if, you know, um, there's a lot of confidence behind this initiative, but we arrived at it by being challenged, right, in, in the academic culture that we had to, uh, to become part of. And I just wanted to say, you know, I was uh, working in, in rural communities and that was my, my first exposure uh, to knowledge was through my interaction with communities. I wasn't planning to be an academic. And uh, I realized I was researching agriculture, gender sensitive agricultural development and food nutrition uh, and women's role in particular in food nutrition in, in four African countries. Uh, and I was traveling around in village communities. I spent a year in, in uh, over, over 60 rural and urban communities in one year. And, and reading uh, international development scholarship and juxtaposing that scholarship to my everyday uh, experiences in the field uh, made me very frustrated because the representations of African realities, whether you know gender specific or in general around development, uh, were just very monolithic. They didn't represent and they didn't reflect and capture the nuance and the distinctiveness of different contexts, different societies, different belief systems, uh, you know, different um, uh, communities and contexts. So. I, I, I became very frustrated and the reason I decided to come back to academia was because I thought that the current exist the, the, the existing theoretical frameworks and the theories uh, to approach uh, you know gender sensitive realities whether in agricultural development or more generally uh, didn't allow me to present and to um, uh, uh, you know, to present what I experienced with the nuance that I experienced it. So I felt the need to come into academia and do a critique of gender and development frameworks uh, in, in reference to the ethnographic experiences that I collected and that I had and, you know, with additional ethnographic research. Um, in order to add that complexity in the analysis, because again, I felt that there that diversity wasn't reflected well. So, so really, it wasn't that I felt, uh, you know, I ever intended to be an academic, or or, or uh, it was something that attracted me. But the need, there was a need to overcome this epistemological colonialism, this cognitive empire, as many others have have called it. 
Um, and, and, and that forced me to sort of come into the global north, come into, um, into the UK. Uh, I, I should add that I was born in Moldova and raised in Greece. And I consider these societies historically part of the Eastern uh, European bloc, I would say, based on their history. Uh, you know, and, and religious cultural differences. And so I had to come into the, the, you know, the UK and prior to that, the US, because I felt that I needed to get that education in order for, for my, to acquire, you know, the voice and the credibility to make a critique and for that critique to be heard and to be accepted. And this is the injustice really that I think both, both for myself and Monica um, motivated a lot of our work. You know, one shouldn't have to come into the global north in order to be heard. One shouldn't have to be westernized and were co-opted partially into the system uh, because that is an inevitable effect of coming and studying uh, you know, and, and, um, in, in a global north context. It, it, it has positive and negative effects, of course. It, you know, it's not monolithic, but, uh, but there is that uh, degree of co-option that is inevitable. And, and it shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be the case that Western knowledge is considered superior. It shouldn't be the case that one should be able to speak within Western epistemology in order to be heard. Um, so it was that frustration, really, that injustice, that epistemic injustice that we experienced uh, that kind of forced us to, you know, uh, develop this idea of decolonial subversions and create a platform that would allow everyone, including including myself as a younger person before coming into, you know, before traveling to the US, before traveling to the UK, to be able to share my knowledge, my lived experience with a platform uh, that that validates it, that acknowledges it, and that shares it. And actually, another important um, motivation with Monica when we were um, editors of the Swaz Journal of Postgraduate Research was the fact that, you know, we, we saw so much research within anthropology and development studies, our respective disciplines, that was published, but it wasn't being critiqued, it wasn't being uh, made accessible to the communities it, it, it addressed, the communities it had uh, been conducted in. There wasn't that dialogue, there wasn't any critique, there wasn't, uh, you know, most of it was in English, uh, it was locked uh, in specialized journals, uh, journal platforms uh, or institutional repositories that were not, you know, easily accessible or found. It, it, there wasn't that uh, immediacy and communication with the communities that that, that research in, presumably wanted to benefit, right? So we felt that that was, you know, something that needed to be addressed. We needed to somehow find a better way to bridge uh, knowledge production with real communities and to make sure that, you know, these barriers uh, by an elite uh, sort of scholarly class, at least that's how I understand it, uh, that, that are created and perpetuated through the system are broken down gradually. So we felt that, you know, you know having something that is open, uh, truly free of charge, doesn't create material barriers for anyone, um, doesn't have, a, you know, a rigid stylistic or, um, you know, structural uh, uh, requirements and, and really allows people to be themselves and to, uh, you know, share their knowledge uh, in whatever form and however they define and conceptualize it from any, uh, any place in the world uh, would be, you know, uh, would add value to the current, um, you know, the current academic culture, I guess. Um, so yes, I, I, I also finally wanted to mention uh, a, not a final um, important element for us, which was reflexivity. Both and I, both Monica and I had multiple conversations about the need for, again, Northern researchers who conduct research in, in low and middle income societies, uh, you know, non-Western societies to be more reflexive of, uh, you know, the, the structural inequalities and the epistemological inequalities that have existed historically, the historical dominance of Western epistemology, which, you know, uh, <laughs> traces to a genealogy of enlightenment, post-enlightenment, post-modernist and so forth thinking, and to, to understand, to understand the, the, the advantage that Northern researchers have uh, by default of their location, the cultural capital that they carry by default of the, their geographical location, and to be more reflexive of their practices, uh, their theory, their, their approach to theorizing, their approach to engaging with communities, and to make that uh, the, the I, to make the I, the personhood of the researcher, um, the identity of the researcher, the positionality of the researcher, central to uh, knowledge production. So we wanted, again, we encourage our contributors to think about their role in the research, to 
and make this transparent uh, to the you know to the extent that they feel comfortable putting themselves out there, of course, um, and to think of the implications of their identity, positionality, and relationship to communities for data collection, for data interpretation, for theorizing. Uh, you know, what does that mean? How does that constrain them? How does that restrict them? How might that bias them? And of course, that applies to us too. Um, so I yes, I would say it really was um, uh, you know our commitment to. Opening, opening knowledge in, in, a, in a very substantive way. You know, as, as editors of the Swiss Journal of Postgraduate Research, uh, we became familiar with this concept of open access publishing, but we quickly realized that open access publishing has kind of ha had been once again co-opted by uh, large publishers who sort of used it to as a, as a business model, really, as a new business model, because, you know, under gold open access publishing, actually, it is the author who is expected to cover the fees, the article processing fees, which can be very high, 2,000, 3,000 USD, depending on, on the, the journal that, that we are referring to. Um, and it was really euphemism. It wasn't. It, it was a euphemism for open access. It wasn't really open access knowledge. It was still, uh, you know, it, it simply transferred the the the, the, um, the material uh, requirements to the author, and under the assumption that the fees would be covered either by the institution or the funder of the author. But Monica and I know very well that not all authors, not all scholars in the world have those material benefits. That there is, they are not in institutions that have. Uh, you know, that offer support with um, open, you know, would pay the fee, would cover the fees for open access publishing. Um, so we were, you know, we, again, we were very aware of um, these material, the underlying material inequalities that, uh, that underpin the dominance of Western epistemology. And we wanted to address this web of asymmetries uh, comprehensively because addressing just epistemological issues and theoretical issues in our disciplines wasn't enough. As you said, I think Antonio mentioned it. It's the practical struct is the structures and the norms and and the, um, the 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 operational mechanism of this whole system that is problematic and it needs to be tackled comprehensively. And I'll stop at this and I'll pass the word to the to the organizers for questions. Um, before we move to questions, and uh, there were a lot of uh, interesting points that uh, we will uh, circle back to, but before we move, I would uh, move on. I would like uh, to ask Danilo to uh, uh, present his presentation as well and let us know uh, what he wants to talk about today. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm actually... Um... The only thing I prepared is the topics that you that you sent. So can I start with that? Uh, okay, okay. So yes, absolutely. The, the first topic. So the dynamics of decolonial endeavors in a global north. So okay, um, I'm gonna give you the answer straight away. I think those endeavors are not good enough. Uh, in fact, I think the so-called endeavors of the global north to decolonize are just the smokescreen actually and i um think that the global north or the global west as we like to call it as well we can call it that as well uh, they are trying to emulate and reestablish uh, colonial patterns to the global south and continue the exploitation of the global south. Um, I will give you three reasons uh, for making that statement. So the first reason, uh, let's call it macro political reason. So the countries like Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Scandinavian countries, they even refuse to uh, acknowledge that they were the part of the colonial project. I mean, France and Britain, they can deny it because it is too obvious, but those countries, they, they refuse it. Uh, and uh, logically, they refuse to face the consequences of colonialism. Uh, let me give you just a couple of examples. For instance, in Belgium, the colonial museum in Tervuren still uh, reflects the glorious Belgian colonial empire in Congo, although it is supposedly been renovated to 
depict the sufferings of the victims of the local population. Um, furthermore, you have um, the famous Tintin, the comic book character that uh, the, the, the most hideous one is Tintin in Congo, which depicts local population pretty similar to monkeys. That is very, of course, uh, uh, insulting to the everyone of the of the African origin in Belgium. That comic book is still widely available in Belgium. Uh, let's go to Germany, for instance. Uh, Namibia is still, a, let's say, a safe haven for Germans that have a nostalgia for fascism. You can find swastikas in Namibia all over very easily. Uh, official German politics refuse to uh, even discuss any kind of compensations or reparations for the victims of, of Namibia uh, genocide, which was actually a demo version of the Holocaust. So Germany is accepting the Holocaust uh, in all modesty and everything, but they refuse to accept the consequences of what happened in Namibia. So we can draw the conclusion that the European or Jewish victims are important, but black victims are not important. Uh, Scandinavian countries, they, um, they simply refuse to, to accept that they were part of slave trade and colonialism, although there are solid historical evidence. Um, I don't wanna get into that. Let's go to France. Uh, we all remember uh, the speech that uh, President Macron gave in Burkina Faso two years ago. So the main session was great because the speech was written by somebody in the foreign office of, of French department of, of foreign ministry. And the main session was good, but in the Q&A session, uh, Macron showed um, his true face uh, by calling them lazy, uh, accusing them of trafficking, that they are responsible for trafficking and so on and so on. So it was, it was a disaster. Uh, you, can, you can find it online. There, there are English uh, translations for those who don't understand French, such as me. Uh, in Britain, um, we have a systematic uh, revision of history. Famous historians like Neil Ferguson, Andrew Roberts, Nick Lloyd, they are continuing the narratives of Reinhard Kipling, right? And they are writing about the empire uh, with sorrow and nostalgia. Let's not forget that uh, one of the former prime ministers of Britain, Gordon Brown, said that the days, quoting, that the days of apologizing for Britain's colonial past are over. And we can see now in the light of Brexit that all kinds of British officials are moving all around Commonwealth, try to establish new deals to somehow uh, compensate the economic damages that will happen from Brexit. Okay, let's go to the second argument. I hope that I'm within the time frame. Uh, so um, next argument is shifting the white man's burden to the East. Uh, West is trying to share the responsibility for colonialism and imperialism to the rest of Europe. They already did that with the First World War and Second World War. They are trying to share the blame for those two wars, although we, of course, know who attacked who. And that is obvious. But in the case of colonialism, that threat is not that obvious and it does not uh, meet such resistance as the revision of the First World and the Second World War because the wars are uh, mainly um, concerning Europeans. So the Europeans resist because they have more resources, but with the colonialism and imperialism, that is not the case. So how do they do that? They portrayed Russia as a colonizer. So that is the 
the most famous tool, the easiest tool to do that. Um, if, if somebody has questions, I can go later into that. But my main argument, colonization, is not the same as, con as conquest. Russia made conquests to the territory eastwards on Siberia, not colonization. There is a difference. We can go later into that. Um, next one is individual actions. They handpick some individuals, let's say from Hungary, from Poland, or some other Eastern European country that were a part of uh, colonial expeditions, for instance, in Congo or somewhere else. And they say, aha, uh -huh, Eastern Europeans were a part of colonialism too. I mean, of course, there is probably numerous Eastern Europeans that individually benefited from their colonial adventures, but uh, not a single uh, Eastern European country held the territory as, as a colony. If you, if you disqualify Austro-Hungaria and Bosnia, that's another story for another topic. Um, the, third, um, the third mechanism they use to shift the blame is the Yugoslavia as the colonizer. So that is also quite interesting. They try to uh, blame the Yugoslavia and that way they try to undermine the non-alignment movement, presenting Yugoslavia as a colonizer. Um, I, mu I must ask, um, which country did Yugoslavia colonize? OK, somebody will probably type Kosovo, but that is simply not true. So Kosovo was the member of Serbia from the Middle Ages. Then it was conquered by the Ottoman Empire, then by Serbia again in 1912. And then with Serbia, it became a member of Yugoslavia, and now it is a self-proclaimed independent state. I'm not going to get into that. It's a sensitive thing for Serbians. But Kosovo was never colonized. In, I, I, that is my strong statement. Um, OK, and the third mechanism, and the last, and I will finish with the first topic. Um, Textbooks and curriculum in the West are still full of the colonial narratives and they are not trying to get rid of them. Um, I just said in the introduction that I spoke with a friend from Kashmir and maybe I knew you can be a witness to that. She told me that uh, during the elementary and middle school and high school, she didn't read any uh, indigenous domestic Kashmiri writers or poets, you just learned, I see you nodding, so I'm right. Uh, you just r read British uh, writers and poets and, and stuff. So that is- Or Indian or Pakistani, but nothing about Kashmir. Nope. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. So, and uh, the biggest, the, my biggest argument in this, in this third section is the Rhodes Scholarship which is still existing. I mean, Cecil Rhodes, he is the essence of imperialism. He is the heart of evil. Forgive me for har harsh words, but um, talking about decolonizing and still uh, endorsing, fetishizing Cecil Rhodes, it's, it's absurd. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. So this is with the first topic. And then later, I will talk about the second one, of course. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, they, all three uh, discussions, all three presentations were very interesting, intense, and thought-provoking. Uh, I I was actually thinking about um, uh, if we can briefly, uh, before uh, we open for questions, if we can briefly talk about the practical ways as to how Global South students and their allies can push for a genuine global decolonial agenda in relation to the individual research projects, uh, course designs, uh, departmental policies, and wider university practices. And then maybe immediately associated with this, we can also talk about the anxieties that we uh, that uh, students, especially uh, the emerging scholars who are being trained in the Western Academy, face in their everyday to day life in these institutions. And 
so uh, this is from a very personal experience but if uh, for example when i am writing something uh, and i'm writing uh, a paper these days uh, and sometimes while writing and it's taking me a lot of time to write uh, this paper but sometimes when i'm writing i feel uh, on the verge of being you know this feeling of being petty like oh i am calling out i am calling them out on so many things that it now sounds petty and i'm just being um not practical enough in a way so uh, these anxieties that we students have to face because we are questioning the structure at such a deep level that it 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 makes us question our own uh, presence uh, uh, presence in the western of being you know in a, of being trained in the western academy so if we can maybe reflect on these points and then we can open uh, for uh, questions and i can see questions are already pouring in so that's interesting so let's let's go Can I add a comment to that? Uh, Monica, is that okay, Danilo? Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to say that we, we invited actually more of our members. So we, we have um, members from 12 countries. Um, actually, I can very quickly reshare that PowerPoint because I do have the, the countries, um, you know, and, and we, we, we invited, uh, you know, multiple colleagues that we thought could speak to these questions that you put to us, because again, I think, when we think about southern researchers or students, uh, you know, they they really need to be, um, you know, we, we need to hear their own testimonies and voices. We can't speak on their behalf. So we wanted, ideally, to have more colleagues join us. Uh, Elise from DRC Congo, who is in South Africa, was very interested, but he couldn't make the day today. Uh, we also had uh, Martin Demeter, whom you might know. He writes a lot on inequalities in publishing, especially in, within communications, and he couldn't make the date either. Um, but essentially, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I, I don't think you know I would qualify to say much on that um, in that sense. Although I am Southern because I am Eastern European in in a way, uh, but I did want to share some insights that came out at a recent workshop we did uh, on the return um, on understanding the role of Eastern Europe in global colonization and decolonization debates. And Danilo actually happened to be in that workshop he, he, he made a very provoking presentation like today and it was about you know understanding again um, where do we stand as Eastern European scholars right in global colonization history in decolonial movements if I can use you know roughly the term movement as Antonio defined it um, and what can we do from our new positionalities right we migrate to the north we migrate to western societies whether for education or because we want to pursue a professional career an academic career and we feel compelled to migrate uk us other western countries in order to be able to have those opportunities right and there was a lot there were a lot of scholars a lot of us felt that uh, you know there is this degree of corruption as you said and there is this pressure of uh, following the standards and, and uh, not necessarily being ourselves. So for instance, if you speak very passionately about your own country and you take a critical position about how your country has been represented within Western scholarship, you might be uh, invalidated by being uh, presented as too biased because you're from that country. And that kind of is used against you, whereas your identity and your experience within that context historically should give you an advantage over the Western scholar who has not necessarily had that experience, right? Um, and, and, and many, many such, uh, you know, um, experiences and, and we, you know, we were debating what can we do from this new positionality? What can we do when there are these different dynamics that play against us oftentimes? Um, and how can we really make a contribution? And one of the things we were saying is from our new positionality, which comes with advantages, of course it comes with challenges, but it also comes with advantages. We suddenly have more voice, we can be heard, we have uh, more funding, perhaps, you know, access to more funding opportunities, we can organize conferences, we can invite people. And we were saying it's, it's it, one of the ways to try and decolonize essentially the system from within the system is by promoting scholars back home right there are there are scholars who have who are based in these societies uh, danilo is serbia right danilo and and uh, and then you have scholars who are in the west and usually it happens that uh, they get invited more often than the Serbian scholars who are located in serbia they're given more validity they're given priority and why is that is that because of the quality of their science or their scholarship not necessarily. So um, I think it's important when we have this new positionality to understand the advantages to promote scholars 
uh, from that specific context community who have knowledge, who have experience, um, to be, you know, again, to, to be humble and understand that we can become a, a, um, a platform really to promote knowledges that haven't been represented in, you know, in this, in, in this context. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think as, as Southern researchers, and again, speaking from my personal experience, if I could, if I could add, um, you know, having, having, you know, traveling and having this exposure to multiple cultures and multiple societies and multiple epistemologies is not necessarily negative. Um, but I think it's important to preserve connections with communities back home, whether it is the communities of research, um, you know, where your work happens, uh, where your studies happen, you know, whatever your, your subject matter is, it's important to have that connection. Because in, in my experience, when that connection is lost, then your ability to uh, ensure that the knowledge you, you produce is reflective of actual lived experience reduces, is reduced, decreases, because you're not in contact with real communities. So I think regardless of geography, and regardless of where we are and what we do, it's important to have those connections to the subject matter and the communities we, wor we work with. And I'll pass the word to uh, Danilo or Monica to add. I just want to address the questions. I see a couple uh, directed towards me. So that, that's on the only thing. So is that okay now? Can I do that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, please, mm -hmm. please, please feel so, free to do uh, that. Yeah, I, I, I saw the, the one about Spain, the comment about Spain, right? So that Spain can also be an example. I just want to say that I agree. So the Spanish rule, especially in Western Sahara, in combination with Morocco as well, is very, very dubious and strange and it can be judged upon, you know, it's it's not a good thing. So uh, Western Sahara is probably one of the remaining colonies in the world, but that is somehow masked because uh, the Morocco is the direct ruler. So it says, oh, it's Morocco, it's not colonization. And yeah, I see about Russia, so isn't conquest a first stage of colonization, right? Um, yes, it is. I mean, of course it is. But my point is I'm using the definition of um, German or Austrian author Jürgen Osterhammel about colonization um, is that there must be an asymmetry in legal and economic and uh, political uh, levels between the monopol uh, met metropoly and the colony. Um, so uh, that was not the case in, in Russia. I mean, the territories are integrated into the Russian empire, later Soviet Union or, or whatever. So uh, they had the same level of, of governing. I don't want to say that some of the communities in Russian empire like Chechens or Dagestanis or some other ethnic minorities uh, weren't treated harshly or discriminately. Of course they were. So, but that is, uh, that is another, another pair of sleeves. You know, it's, it's not colonization. So yes, the, the conquest is the first stage of colonization, but not, uh, it's not the same. And I see a couple of more, is it long? Um, could you reflect the position of Roma? Yeah, in educational curricula in Yugoslavia and present day Serbia, for example, the strong, the gypsy uh, phrases, his horse, yeah, is still part of the curriculum. Why uh, is it that this is not viewed as a problematic and what can be done about this? Um, yes, we could make an agreement that Yugoslavia did not colonize, but what about the treatment of Roma? Yeah, I expected this, <laughs> though educational curricula especially. Um, regarding the curricula, I agree. The curricula is in Serbia is, mm, I'm not an expert on the topic, I must, uh, no to that, 
the curricula in Serbia is um, quite outdated regarding all aspects, regarding Roma, regarding um, gender issues, regarding people with disabilities. So I agree with that. But um, uh, about the position of Roma in, in Yugoslavia, I will use the, the statements of Selma Selman, which is the Bosnian Roma activist in, in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, she is helping the local Roma communities in Bosnia and a little bit in Serbia across the border. And she is emphasizing that her, well, the clients is a bad word, but I don't know any other. Uh, they are calling her Selma Selman is Tito. So that is the reference. And she is trying to say, I watched a couple of interviews that within Yugoslavia, the Roma uh, were feeling quite okay. I don't know if that is the true, but my logic is if that wasn't the case, why would they call her Tito? I mean, she is their benefactor, you know, she is helping them and uh, all in all people in the communities, they are calling her Tito. You can find that, find that online. I'm going to type the Serbian word and you can get the, the YouTube video. So Selma, Selman, so the article go, the video clip goes like this. And regarding the curriculum, I mean, uh, curriculum needs improving, but they're on the positive light. Serbian government is financing uh, elementary schooling of uh, all the Roma uh, children. They, they receive, everything is free, free for them and they receive some kind of scholarships and uh, books, uh, and other stuff for high school and college, it's also free. So it's not great, but better something than nothing. You must bear in mind that Serbia is a quite unprivileged country for all of us. So the resources uh, are limited. Thank you. Thank you for those reflections, Danilo. I, I would quickly ask uh, Antonio to uh, raise a point here. Thank you, Ayn. I actually wanted to go back to what uh, Rumina said about uh, promoting uh, scholars from the global south, maybe within their own uh, context, and as well as uh, providing opportunities for them maybe to come to an institution like CEU. And I think, to be fair, CEU does a pretty uh, actually laudable job in terms of uh, representation and um, it's actually one of the, I would say, most international universities um, out there. And um, but the, the problem with that is that once students um, come to an institution like this, I feel that the, the way that we do our research and our epistemologies, they are already kind of speaking towards a very specific research tradition, which then um, kind of raises the problem of co-optation as as you were also hinting at earlier. And I feel that um, in most research uh, projects as well done by Global South scholars, and, and if they follow a, a certain research tradition, then that kind of really doesn't leave any space for the reflexivity that you were also looking at because there's basically, if you do a, a positivist project, which is deemed as a legitimate way of knowing things. Um, there is no space for reflexivity simply because um, you know it, it doesn't factor in um, that kind of framework, and they simply just claim then that um, there is no space for that. I don't have the skill sets uh, to to do this kind of thing, and therefore I would stick to what I know uh, based on, you know, what we discuss in, in, in universities. So I just really wanted to maybe uh, get a sense of how you view this um, maybe paradox and um, 
yeah if, if you could. I would like to, to let Monica address you know how, how we want to engage our southern partners but I just want to say something about CEU so Martin Dimitri I wanted Martin to be here because he has done a study um, analyzing uh, the background the training background of academics of, of members of staff in the top 100 universities uh, in Eastern Europe, and CEU is obviously amongst them. And I, I will quote from his article because I'm not a specialist. This is not my area of specialization. But essentially, what? Uh, but I have reviewed Martin's book, and and Martin essentially is is arguing that. Um, you know, there is a core periphery sort of system. Uh, and we think the core periphery with the core being, you know, Northern societies and the periphery Southern societies uh, also existing uh, uh, another core periphery. So within the periphery itself, there is a core and a periphery. There are some institutions that prevail in Eastern Europe uh, and others that are marginalized. So for instance, the American University of Bulgaria um, or CEU are, are quite elite institutions, considered elite institutions in Eastern Europe, where, whereas many other institutions that are as good in terms of quality and the research they produce and the knowledge they produce are not as uh, well known um, and, and perhaps not as uh, um, wealthy in terms of resources. So uh, what Martin did actually in that study was to look at the training of the, of the members of staff because the type of training that the members of staff have uh, will, as you say, Antonio, will determine what they teach and how they teach, you know, the curricula, the syllabi, the pedagogies. Uh, and, and in CU specifically, um, a quote, Martin wrote, amongst the sociology staff members of CEU, there is no one with a Hungarian or other Eastern European PhD. While all staff members have Global North, typically American education, 60%. Consequently, it is rather questionable that CEU represents Central European knowledge at all. Rather, one could only expect to learn mainstream Western knowledge. Now, close. Quote. Now, Martin is very radical in his critique, so I don't want to say that this necessarily reflects the situation. And this article was published, I think, a few years ago, so things might have changed. Let me just give you the date. Oh, no. Okay, it was published recently, 2020. <laughs> okay. Um, so I am, I am guessing. I can share this article after I speak, um, but, but what I'm trying to say is not about the diversity of the student body only, it's about the diversity of the members of staff, it's about the diversity of the curricula, the diversity of syllabi, and oftentimes, yes, of course, you're limited practically if you don't have knowledge, uh, you know, uh, you, you haven't previously conducted, let's say, ethnographic research in Ethiopia. And you have a student who wants to do that and you, you don't feel equipped to advise them or you know to, to support them in that project then you have to be honest and tell them that so you know that might be a restriction but i think you know it's not just about you uh, supporting a student who needs to do field work abroad it's how you teach in the classroom right which you can do no matter what training you have no matter what you where you come from you can diversify your teaching and and yes i i don't want to sound judgmental because again academics are under a lot of pressure uh, you know, they have the pressure of producing in order to be promoted, in order to be, uh, you know, to be validated and to be able to preserve their uh, position and to be able to move up the ladder. And everyone wants that because this is the system. It's a reward based system, right? You have to, uh, to, to play the rules of the game, essentially. Um, and, and that has a certain to toxicity in it. So, so I, think, I think it's important to um, understand the system, understand the different pressures, that it's not that easy to change that system uh, and, and try to navigate it again with reflexivity and humility because we cannot as, as individuals we cannot change that but I think once you start recognizing the symptoms and the problems then you can take small steps to change that then you can get out of your comfort zone you know they can you can explore you can expand and, and try different things within your classroom pedagogically speaking and, and, and again diversifying the curricula you know starting there. Um, and I'll, I'll just pass the word to, to, to Monica, maybe because, um, you know, we have had this discussion about how to decentralize decolonial subversions and engage the southern partners. And I think, Monica, you might, you might be able to say a bit on that. Yeah, thanks, Romina. And I, yeah, uh, I build on that. And I also want to reply to Chu's question on how we plan to manipulate the broader system of academia. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I have um, this is my personal opinion, and it may be a little bit radical when it, uh, with when, compared to others here, perhaps. I don't know. Um, my question is: Do we really have to manipulate university when it gives us so many? Um, there are so many barriers 
um, and I have addressed this question uh, um, extensively with uh, students I was tutoring for two years in, in a course on the margins of philosophy, uh, post-colonial queer and gender studies. And we kept, um, we kept coming to the same conclusions that the university simply does not offer the basis for uh, uh, radical change for uh, to hear radical voices um, because very often what we have now there are um, uh, yeah there are scholars or tutors or lecturers who are not white but what language do they speak what voices like whose voices are they um, are they highlighting so yeah, then there comes also this whole other issue about uh, sustainability, about money. If you uh, if you want to research and you need funding, then you also have to comply with the ideology of the funder. Uh, so it is really difficult. So my question is really, um, why not look at something more radical? And this is also a little bit why Rumina and I decided in the first place not to be um, to be within the university, because at the beginning of our um, of our journey with the colonial subversions, we have also um, contemplated whether to do it in close affiliation with SOAS. But uh, again, we have explored various ways, and it just was not satisfactory enough for what we wanted to do. So. Um, one thing that uh, we would like to do uh, to break away from from this because like um, university is usually also um, associated with rigorous knowledge right because it gives us these parameters <laughs> um, but we don't have to lose rigor the moment we move out from uh, from uh, university um, we, in fact, we are trying to, Romina and I are trying to highlight different parameters of impact, which are not the usual, um, how many times have, have I been quoted by uh, Jonah such and such. Um, and, and there is a self-fulfilling prophecy here, uh, because if I want to have a career in academia, then I have to publish in A-list journals and I have to be quoted within them. So this is a closed circle. Um, the parameters that instead at the colonial subversions we would like to look at are things such as in which area of the world has a paper or a photograph or a, uh, or a poem uh, had impact? Where has it been listened to? In what language has it been listened to? Uh, and what connections has it created? What people has it brought together? So these are things that are difficult to measure or they may not necessarily have to be difficult, but it's a new way of thinking. So. Um, we need to still find ways of measuring them and of bringing them out there into into the public but um yeah i think we really want to move away from this idea that it has to be an institution that validates our knowledge um so this is um yeah i i'm a little bit um disillusioned with the whole institution um and now coming on to how um uh, how we are involving uh, our South uh, colleagues from the South. Um, there are <laughs> multiple ways, and this comes already from just looking at our web page, and I can share the screen perhaps, so you can um, just have a look. Okay, I am not very practical, obviously. I th um, so I'm clicking, I thought, wait share screen do you see the can anybody tell no. me if, no we don't see no 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 yet the green button have you clicked that monica i have clicked share screen it's not working i don't know why do you want me to share the platform yeah, and yeah that would be nice thanks romina sorry uh, i let me just try and bring it up because I have too many windows open, but I'll just bring it up very quickly. So while Domina is doing this, I wanted to say that, yeah, this uh, entire web page has been um, conceived and brought into being by um, our um, IT team and design team in India. 
um, in particular Nirbhay Sen, Mukesh Manda. And um, this also um, is in a way a continuation of us working closely with, uh, with Global South. I know Global South is very problematic, but with, uh, colleagues from like uh, less privileged parts of the world, how we did also for our logo for the earlier journal that we have been editing where uh, the logo was designed by Daniel Desta, is that correct, Romina? Yep, yep, yeah. in Ethiopia. Okay. Yes, in Ethiopia. So, um, can can everybody see now the um, yep. page? Yeah? Okay, great. So, yeah, um, the, also when you see the, um, the, the, design, the, the background of the design, this is a very specific, um, it, it's, a, it's a type of weave which is common across uh, a lot of um, the, uh, southern countries. Um, these photographs have been taken by one of our other colleagues in India. So these particular designs are Indian and it's called um, uh, wait, ECAT. <laughs> ECAT. Um, but you can find ECAT not only in India, it goes all the way to uh, South America and um, and also the other way, like towards Southeast Asia. You have um, ECAT in a, in a lot of places. And uh, ECAT, as some of you may know, has also, um, in the Indian history, has also occupied a particular place when it comes to um, the the weavers reclamation of um, of their rights. Um, this is for the uh, structure of the web page and so then yeah Romina shows us that we have like different uh, types of contributions. The other way of um, highlighting the work of uh, southern colleagues and so is to um, to have um, when, when we, we expect uh, to um, that our that the contributors in their references cite um, a majority of non uh, uh, people from, not from the Western Hemisphere um, in and and also people differently abled people, people of color and women, or these also, again, they don't have to quote anything that comes from any fancy journal. So this is how we, again, want to change these parameters. And uh, another very important thing is this quite radical concept of um, rotational editorship. So in the beginning, Romina and I, we obviously, being the founders, we have been um, bringing out the first issues um, and we are, we have currently one regular issue and one special issue that uh, Romina has edited. Um, the, net, the special issue is something that we want to delegate as much as possible, like uh, in terms of conceptualization and uh, organizing the peer review process and everything to colleagues it, located in different parts of the world. And they, again, they don't necessarily have to be at a university. Um, we obviously will help them with any, um, if there needs to be any help in terms of, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> proofreading. We have a proofreader, for example, who is very, um, who is very good. So in these things we can help them, but the conceptualization and the, the, the knowledge production is really in the hands of colleagues, um, <coughs> excuse me, from, from other parts of the world. Um, in fact, um, the, one of the future, uh, special issues is going to be led by Professor Alex Kanimba from uh, Romina. Can you remind me what university he is? Uh, in Nav Namibia. In Namibia, yes. Namibia, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, there's um, Romina's current. Uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit um, uh, moving around, and I don't know if Romina can follow uh, this. <laughs> On the, on the screen. So here, yeah, the, who we are, this is the, um, it's a partial um, list of our, um, of the team really, the technical team, um, we have a photographer, web designer, then we have a team of translators, which obviously has to be um, located in different parts of the world. Um, when it comes to translation also, we want to emphasize that it's not, it's, it's not sufficient to be fluent in two of 
or more languages, but it's really about being familiar and comfortable with different cosmological contexts because uh, translation is not a one-on-one -on -one relationship it's really like understanding the larger context so this is something if, if translation wants to be done really um, sophisticately then it, it has to be done by people located in the different in, in different contexts so uh, this is another aspect um what else yeah the editorial board monica yes i think you mentioned that did you yeah the um, I, did, mm. I did not mention but yeah also the editorial board is is very diverse um you if yeah rumina is scrolling through it uh, you can see these are uh, Ali, professor alex Kanimia from namibia Tungiko um is in china but also working in uh, from the i think in australia um like yeah you can see you can later go through the web page yourself we are going i'm going to share the the link immediately after talking um yeah and then maybe if you um if the, there is also the manifesto which again also includes as one of the main principles that of being an open uh, project that of uh, we want to grow it's it's a it's a growth all together. So um, this is how we are hoping to be as decentralized as possible. And um, Romina and I being facilitators who are giving a platform more than anything else, really. Um, I think that is ah, And yeah, maybe we have, as I was talking about special issues and uh, current issues, we have our um, latest call for contributions running. Um, so yeah, if you go to become involved, contribute, yes. Uh, yeah, here the call for contributions. This is our current call. And you will see that it's really broad. The only condition <laughs> is that we will consider any teams concerned with the praxis of decolonization. So that's all that we ask for. Um, so we want to be as broad as possible and as open. It should be open to anybody, really. And we, we put an emphasis on praxis, though, because we feel, again, in the academia, there's a lot of focus on theory, which is then just remains in theory without applying in the everyday life what we have done. So yeah, I don't know. I hope that this has answered the question. And thanks, uh, Romina, for sharing the screen and for like going showing us the website. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. I'm so sorry I have to interrupt because we are running uh, over time, yeah. I think. And uh, I, I quick before we wrap up, uh, I would quickly ask uh, Taraf to raise her point, and then uh, maybe we can uh, wrap. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I know that there's some uh, points in the chat, so I'll be brief so we can uh, try and address those as well. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is this, basically the labor of this. Um, I often wonder with this, there is so much that I have on my plate to be able to, um, at this point, not even get a job in academia, but to even finish a, a PhD. And there is a lot of labor that comes from uh, having to um, not only conduct this kind of uh, work, but also um, um, there is the burden of proof, there's the burden of having to explain, and that is often placed on um, um, on scholars from, from um, I would say, from either the, the, the global south um, or scholars that are not working in the mainstream. And I think that that is definitely um, a conversation that we are having now, uh, but it's coming up with less and less solutions. I mean, I we hear a lot about there's a problem in academia, um, and this is not necessarily just in the context of publishing, but it's just out of all of what we have talked about. There definitely is so much work that needs to be done and is being done. But um, to what um, 
kind of to what level is this labor being placed on on uh, students or researchers that are already more that, that already don't have access to funding that easily that might not be able to get jobs that easily uh, be, to be able to do this and um, secondly I found that the point on CEU very interesting um, um, and I definitely could see how that problem how that is very problematic and uh, uh, I also think though, and I, and I will be very f blunt about this. I would not necessarily have approached CEU with my project if I did not think that CEU would have the um, reputation, the, you know, all of these little ticked boxes that then will enable me to possibly uh, build a career in what I want to do, right? And that is the world that we're living in. Um, um, would I have wanted to, to, stay, to stay in my home country and do the research there with a, um, um, university there, yes. Would I want to actually make a living wage doing that? That would not be that would not be possible. And so I think that it is a very systemic problem. But also, it's important to all to do such an analysis to kind of understand um, how these institutions kind of measure up um, within the system and and um, uh, how are they part of the problem um, or not. And I know that there was in the chat. Sorry, this is the last point, but. Um, um, about kind of the definition of, of South and Global South. And I know that there are different definitions that happen. We specifically with the movement as Antonio, maybe uh, um, this was missed at the beginning. It's, we do not define it necessarily in a, this very geographical sense as much as it is this shared experience of being in the periphery, um, of being under different power structures. Um, um, and so it's, we want to move away also from that box, right? Of saying that this is global south, this is not global south and, and kind of try and open up what would actually mean in terms of the experience of South um, 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 uh, researchers and research and, and, and thought. So that, that those were my points. Um, I don't know if there's there have been some questions on the um, on the chat that maybe I can kind of uh, bring up. I think there was a question about the indigenous people and and the countries. Um, that question was for Romina. Um, and then there is, are there different constituents and collaborators at uh, Decolon and Subversions paid for their labor? I'm aware that in academia peer review and other services usually are mobilized through unpaid labor. So, um, yeah. Oh, I th that was answered, sorry. Okay, so that question was answered, uh, but um, it's the question about indigenous people, please. Uh, Taraf, because I disconnected my chat disappear, could you read out the question? Oh, you're muted, Taraf. Typical. <laughs> what, about, what about indigenous people in those countries? Um, in relation to how we engage them in this initiative? I, I would I would assume so. There's not much elaboration. So uh, no, if the I, person, I I think actually this question was in uh, as a it it was provoked by your uh, definitions of global south and global north, and there are indigenous communities in what we would generally perceive to be as global north countries, such as U.S. Northern America. So, uh, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Uh, so what about the indigenous populations in those uh, specific um, countries? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a, a long conversation, you know, the conversation of con around concepts. And I think, um, again, I, I, in line with Taraf's thinking, we are not rigid in our definitions because everyone has a different definition. But what we, we don't like is when people use these big concepts or umbrella terms without defining them. So what the practice that we try to encourage is when we speak in those terms that we give a working definition so that everyone can follow what we mean, right? So every definition has restrictions, advantages and disadvantages, and it's important that we 
uh, we sort of explain why we define it in the way we do each time in that in that specific context. So uh, Martin and I, for instance, you use a scient scientometric definition because it's something that we can demonstrate based on you know, the contribution of publications and citations in work production, for instance, based on regions. Uh, but but we don't. I I'm personally very um, critical of the term global south because again it's overly used. Uh, it's not defined. Different people mean different things, and it's uh, oftentimes it, it means too many things that it loses its essence. It, it loses its use. Right when it means too many things, then it means almost nothing. So then there is this problem of uh, you know definitions. Uh, but of course there are you know multiple south within the global south as we say and multiple peripheries within the core and cores within the periphery and we all understand that it's it's a very complicated matrix i don't think that we want to draw boundaries uh, you know or we want to rigidly define because a lot of these uh, dynamics because they are dynamics they are relevant relevant to whom global south your global, your southern relevant to whom right so it's a relational almost analytic uh, analytical framework as opposed to a, an absolute um, definition. Um, so I would agree with Taraf on that. Um, and just to, to add, because I disconnected, when Monica was speaking about our engagement with Southern partners, uh, a lot of our Southern partners, especially, for instance, I work in Ethiopia, many of my colleagues don't, don't relate to the term decolonization. Ethiopia has been one of the countries that, that was never colonized. And, and they're very proud of that. And when I speak of decolonial um, activism, for instance, they understand the idea and the motivation and the problems that we're trying to address, but they don't necessarily relate to the term. Uh, and, and many of the issues that we are dealing with are not necessarily their priorities. So this is one of the reasons that Monica and I are very, have left the definition open. You know, we, we're very uh, transparent about the fact that we are addressing problems that we're faced in this context, uh, you know, very, very um, directly, we face these problems. And these problems have global implications, but they're not necessarily everyone's priorities. You know, the, the way we approach decolonization and diversity in, in Western academia is not the way it's approached in Ethiopia or Namibia. And we have, ha have had these conversations with our editorial board members and advisory board members, uh, and we don't necessarily share the same priorities. Uh, and well, Monica and I find it very um, uh, uh, essential that we have these conversations within the team. And th this is what we build on, on the dialogical consultative model. I recently said in a presentation that it's not about the end point, it's about the journey, the process. How do we do things? How do we collaborate? How do we um, work towards these activist goals? Are we working uh, on the basis of the principles and the values we stand for? Uh, or are we just reproducing dynamics in the name of decolonization, right? So I think we're trying to embody, that's why we'd like to speak about praxis. We're trying to embody the values we want to see. And finally, on the point of payment, we are absolutely against free labor. I've worked in international development as an intern before. I think it's such an exploitation. It's a model used by international agencies for, for free labor. Um, and I think, and we are absolutely against it. This is one reason why Monica and I have done most of the work because we don't want to delegate work and time, you know, work that requires time uh, in the sense of, you know, the operational side of things. But of course we have benefited uh, deeply from the consultation and feedback and advice of our collaborators. But we are very keen, for instance, now, we would love to translate more contributions in more languages and our team members have offered to do it, but we cannot pay them. So we refuse, we have postponed. We don't want them to translate, you know, um, uh, and, and exert that energy and time when they cannot afford it, just, just for us to promote these objectives. We understand the priorities. We understand that everyone is limited. When they can, they can contribute. It's all voluntary. If, if they can't, then it won't happen, but we still appreciate that they're willing and appreciate the gesture and the commitment. This is really how we function. It's people first and objective second. But obviously, if the if the relationships are uh, you know mutually reciprocal and mutually respectful, then I think the objectives will also be furthered and promoted at the end of the day. Um, thank you, uh, Romina, for those uh, wonderful reflections. And we are already over time, but uh, before I uh, wrap up, uh, I would like to mention that we have uh, 
send out our emails in the chat if you uh, if any of you would like to get in touch with us and uh, I also want to uh, say a little bit before we wrap up uh, that we need to keep continuing these conversations and need to uh, uh, come up with new and more nuanced and more inclusive definitions for all of us. It's very difficult and we are still trying to situate ourselves, whether we call in, uh, whether it's geographically or epistemologically, ontologically, all of that. We, we do not know what we are. Are we still, are we really global South or not? Uh, the south whether we can truly call ourselves in the south there are a lot of um uh there are a lot of problems with a lot of terms and we need to keep have having these conversations and that i think is very important and i would also like to kind of raise the and it goes back to the very beginning of the conversation when uh we were talking about uh that it's not important the reason why we are uh, in western academia is not because we want to be heard and i want to give a shout out to a friend of mine who we were we were having a conversation earlier to jessica who actually talked about uh she's here jessica uh and we, who actually talked about something that kind of stuck it, it 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 talks she talked about the racialized suffering as a spectacle and this makes me wonder that when we are so passionate about the uh, about who we are and we want to talk about our by bringing us our intersubjective identities into conversation about our race about our sexuality gender uh, uh, as uh, or or the uh, bearing of all those uh, identities at the same time how we are stripped of them and reduced to something of a non entity uh, how the suffering that happens through through that stripping of our identities the racialization that happens through that is a spectacle and the kind of consistent and most importantly the acute awareness of not allowing that to happen while uh, while make, while challenging the structural apparatus as it is is something that we need to keep in mind and that are, those are the conversations and those those are the things that we need to keep going about so I, i'm sorry i'm blabbering at this point but this is this was something that i thought uh, we should raise um uh, so uh, thank you so much, Danilo, Monica, Romina, for uh, being here with us for this very, very interesting uh, as Chu Peng. I'm so sorry, Chu. I, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing your name uh, right. Uh, said it was fire. Uh, and th that would be our uh, hope for the events that we will have in future as well. Uh, thank you so much for every. Uh, thank you so much to our wonderful, most wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, participants uh, who came here. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm so bad with terms, but thank you everyone for joining us, for coming here, for making this event so wonderful. I would like to, before I say uh, thank you, before I say bye, I would like to ask Taraf and Antonio so to say final words and then we can say, uh, we can end this. <laughs> Yeah, thank you everybody for um, the conversation. Thank you for Romina, Monica, and Danilo. I think this was really good way for us to kick off the movement that we are hoping uh, to continue on. And I think uh, um, we are looking forward to mo to more conversations uh, like this, as we as we now all know that there's a lot of uh, um, a lot to be done. Um, but it's also rewarding and exciting. Um, even though frustrating work to, to do. Um, so thank you everybody for, for being here and please um, sign up to our mailing list so that you can uh, stay informed of all the different reading uh, um, um, groups and discussion uh, series that we will have. Antonio, please. Just really uh, thank you for, for agreeing to come to us and share your experience as a, uh, off-center journal, let's say. And I think I would even now claim to say that we're really fellow travelers and I resonated quite a lot with the challenges that you had navigating Western institutions and making like a, uh, like something like a decolonial subversions as a movement itself kind of work and take off the ground. And I think um, we'd, we'd take a leaf out of your book, um, if you like. Uh, moving forward. And I, I hope we can continue kind of um, this discussion. And um, yeah, we'll be happy also to um, share your resources within our colleagues at CEU. 
and 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 maybe they would be happy to reach out to you and and contribute to to the journal. If you would Thank like you so to, to say a, a few words before we wrap up and um, yeah, we welcome fun. contributions <laughs> in any form, language <laughs> or style. We'd love to see more student pieces. Absolutely, we really do. Um, and again, diverse perspectives because uh, it's it's really frustrated to get published in the early stages. I know that, and we do want to help uh, students, you know, develop their career. We do understand that people, some people, do choose their path, that path, and, and you know, we want this initiative to be of benefit um, to students in particular. So please do contribute if you have pieces you haven't published. They're perhaps a bit more critical or outspoken. We would love to um, to review them, to have them. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I just want to second that and thank all of you for having us and for listening to our experience. And I shared the link to our web page in the chat. And yes, uh, we hope to be in touch with many of you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, any final thank words, Danilo? Danilo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if, if, so please go ahead, Romina. Yeah, uh, just thanking Danilo for joining us. It, uh, you yeah. know, we're really so great. Everything is being covered. We 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 are out of time. So just thank you, everybody. I hope uh, you enjoyed it, and that's it. <laughs>